Hey guys, what's up? This is Eric Johnson. I want to talk about my descent into hell with alcohol. And uh, I'm doing it in the car just to really get, you know, intimate with you guys and really dive deep into my story. Because I feel like I can help somebody out there who's struggling with alcohol and realize it just gets worse. It's a progressive disease. It doesn't take a break, even if you do. And uh, I've witnessed that hundreds of times. Uh, you know, I relapsed hundreds of times and I finally got sober and I'll tell you how I did that. But I wanna start at the very beginning, how I discovered alcohol, uh, what it did to me, how I felt and what eventually happened. So uh, I was brought up in a very sheltered family. Um, my parents were pretty strict and uh, they sheltered us. We, we, I grew up in a small town in Washington State. I could see the, I could see Canada from across the water, and uh, it was very beautiful, very idyllic. You know, Victorian town, a lot of 1800s houses, and uh, you could walk from one end of town to the other without being harassed. There were no gangs predominantly white and uh, you know it was just a very beautiful childhood but my dad was very strict and he had a scary temper and I was highly sensitive and I liked to play alone and I started to rock back and forth uh, as a toddler and uh, they call that stimming it's self-soothing um, maybe because my environment was um, scary to me. I don't, I don't really know why I started, but I couldn't stop. And in fact, I stopped rocking uh, just three months ago after doing it for 46 years. Uh, but that's another story in itself. Um, so basically, I was sheltered, and I didn't, I wasn't exposed to any drugs or alcohol um, until I was 17. I finally tried some uh, alcohol and um, I was scared of it. I didn't know what it was going to do. In fact, when I was about five years old, I saw a drunk person and um, walking on a wharf in California and I asked my dad, I was like, what's wrong with him? And my dad was like, oh, he's drunk. And I didn't even know what that meant, but he, that man scared me. It was, it was unpredictable. I thought he was crazy and my dad just shrugged it off. Um, but that stuck with me because I would soon become that man. And I'll get to that in a minute. So the first time I had a beer, my friends gave it to me. They were like stoners and jocks and and they were already, you know, partying. And uh, I I drank like half of it. And then I went around the corner and poured it out in the sink without them knowing. And I pretended like I had finished it. I was scared I was going to get drunk. I really didn't know what a beer would do. The second time I drank was a couple months later, and it was wine coolers. Wine coolers were all the rage back then, and uh, I got a four-pack. And it tasted like Kool-Aid, so it was easy to drink. And I believe I had maybe two out of the four-pack at a dance and actually had the courage to ask a girl to dance with me. So I'm like, wow, this is like liquid courage, you know, this is great. And I had a lot of energy when I drank um, and it just did something to me when it hit my mouth. I could instantly feel the effervescence going through my veins. It was almost like a magical potion. It gave me incredible energy uh, because maybe I felt suppressed my whole life. My dad was strict and I didn't feel like I could really speak my thoughts or be me or anything like that. So when I had alcohol, all this weight lifted off of my shoulders. I could be me, I could feel free, I could laugh, I could be talkative, and it literally made me maniacal. I, um, later on when I would drink, I could, I stayed up all night, uh, laughing, running around the streets, uh, just insane energy, just being, uh, just going into mania with drink. You know, a lot of people when they drink, they they pass out or they get sleepy, but not me. It was like speed. And I just got really crazy and just like lit up and would just run around. And I wanted to talk to everyone in the world like it was my last day on earth because I, I couldn't feel that free when I was sober. 
I felt like I was in some kind of prison. So I really took to alcohol and um, all my role models were alcoholics, you know, from the rockers to the to the writers. Uh, I just romanticized alcohol completely, but I really didn't hit it hard um, until I was, you know, 19 or 20. Uh, I started to get drunk um, probably two times a week uh, between the ages of 18 to 20. It was about two times a week. And then, you know, I was still really scared of the hangover. I hated it. I was, I would get really hungover and vomit, you know, the next day if I drink, you know, strawberry milk at work, I would be vomiting in the toilet. And I hadn't uh, discovered yet that I could get rid of the hangover by just drinking uh, more alcohol in the morning to get rid of the hangover. That came later. So, but... Uh, when I was 20, I, I met a, a woman and uh, at the restaurant I worked at, and she was 20 years older than me, and um, we were both artists, and so she invited me over for some wine, and um, I stayed the night, and then eventually I moved in with her, and we would drink red wine and, and talk, you know, literature and art and watch movies together, a lot of, like, cult classics and we would, she was a rocker as well. She was just older than me and she was really cool. She wore leather, black leather and had tattoos and I'd never seen a girl with tattoos before. So she turned me on to the art world. I started to drink more with her and um, it was up to three to four times, um, four times a week at that point, uh, drinking to the point of blacking out. And it was fun for a while until three years into that relationship, I started to become an angry drunk and I would take out my anger on her. And mainly that was because I was giving my parents a silent treatment that had lasted a couple years. And it was really hard on me because um, I loved my parents, but I was being rebellious. And so it was eating me alive and there was a lot of stress in my life. And the alcohol wasn't helping it at all. And dating a woman that basically the age of my mom was confusing to me. And I, I wondered why I just couldn't date girls my age. Uh, so that started eating me alive. And I was getting to the point where I was, I was getting drunk five days a week. I was either drunk or hungover. I could barely hold on to a dishwashing job. And then when I was 24, I finally left her to go to Job Corps. And that was on the Oregon coast. And I trained on tugboats for a little while and I was sober. That was when I got turned on to AA. I got turned on to AA before I left for Job Corps. Uh, because I got in trouble with the law um, and had to do anger management and go to AA. In AA, I was, you know, I people were, um, I felt like I, you know, was laughed at. You know, one guy in there, he'd been sober for like 10 years, 20 years, and he just kind of laughed at me when I shared my story. Uh, I was literally homeless like she kicked me out of the house and I, I had my I took my bag into the AA meeting every literally everything I owned was in this bag and this guy laughed at me so I was like screw you I'm out of here um, but then I went to job corps and I, I tried AA again had a cool sponsor so I was sober for nine months in job corps when I got out I was 25 and I had made amends finally to my parents. So things were finally okay with them after years of silent treatment and 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 telling them to F off. Um, you know, it was hard. You know, I, I'd been giving my dad the silent treatment since I was 16. And then again from, you know, 20 to 24. And it was eating me alive, but finally made amends and my parents went to counseling while I was gone. So we had a better relationship and they, they helped me move on to their commercial property back in uh, the small town I grew up in. I lived in a 15 foot trailer that they bought for me. 
I was hanging out there having t a good time. I started writing a novel on a little old typewriter and riding my bicycle at night and, and being healthy. I had no credit card debt or any bills and I used to ride my bike around at night and listen to music. I was really happy in writing a novel. And then six months into that, I met my neighbors and they were, they were on social security, disability, they were crazy. And I was like, these guys would be great in my novel, so I'm gonna start hanging out with them, kind of like doing my own little private research on them. They were like literally out of the book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, just crazy guys. One was from Haight-Ashbury, he was a hobo, he was deaf, and so he would just talk super loud, and he couldn't hear anyone, but he loved to drink. And he would walk throughout town in the morning, checking the dumpsters for bottles that had, you know, a little bit of alcohol left in them and he'd pour it all in one cup and drink it and I just thought that was great you know because I'm 25 I'm kind of romanticizing them a little bit and eventually I was like why not just join them so my nine months of sobriety got shattered I started drinking with them going over there I started experimenting with more drugs and I was starting to get really drunk I was getting more drunk than ever before that's the the progression of the disease is that, you know, the nine months of sobriety didn't matter. I was back to my old drinking and, and worse after um, just drinking for a couple weeks with those guys. And I was starting to black out. I was starting to get really crazy and I would pound my my fists on their floors and their trailers and, and do crazy stuff. And um just whatever i wanted to do i would i would do it i would just run around wild and sometimes i would get thrown in jail and sometimes i would even get lost you know i'd get so drunk i got lost in their their uh on their property one time i literally like tangled up in the blackberry bushes and and uh sean one of the people over there who i really liked he was like the alpha male came up and gave me a hit of meth and it instantly popped me out of this drunk and I knew where I was and I was like this is oh my gosh you know it just snapped me out of this drunk and now I want to go out on the town and I hopped in my car went downtown and hit all the bars and and did this crazy stuff um so it was a wild time at least I thought, you know, things were still good. I was listening to awesome music, you know, new metal just come out, you know, Linkin Park, Corn, and Limp Bizkit. And I used to drive around with those guys in my Honda Prelude and we'd have a case of beer in the back and just drinking and driving everywhere, just blaring Limp Bizkit, feeling cocky, listening to this jock rock and, and Weasel in the back, the hobo from Haight-Ashbury just yelling, this is great this is great and sean would be in the front seat and he was just rocking out because they weren't used to music they're living in their commune listening to old you know credence clearwater revival i turned them on to limp biscuit and they're going crazy in my car so it was fun for a while uh but i was still getting in trouble and breaking up with girls and and doing crazy stuff and just you know, I could barely hold on to a job. I was cooking now in the restaurant business. All the cooks drank, you know, the waitresses drank, uh, people were sleeping with each other. It was just a big orgy, you know, um, living in this small town with everyone drinking and everyone drinks in the restaurant business. So I was having a blast and until I was 32 and I had a heart attack at work. Uh, it was my uh, a new job. I'd been there only for a day, and I was dehydrated, hungover from Cinco de Mayo, drank almost a fifth of tequila, and I felt my chest get uh, really uh, tight. And I turned white, and I went outside, and then I felt nauseous, ran to the bathroom, vomited, and then I, I, had, to, I had diarrhea at the same time, and I could barely get on the toilet. I almost messed myself and then I I went out on the sidewalk and I laid down and I was trembling I was freezing and all of a sudden a waitress stood over me and she was a born-again Christian and she started praying for me and I had a lot of people talk about Jesus in my past and I just ignored them and so I just waved her off I was like thank you I'm you know and then the paramedics came flew me to 
the hospital and I had a stent placed in my, my left artery, that was like 80% clogged. So I could have died from that, but it didn't stop me from drinking. I was like, that was just a fluke. I'm going to keep drinking. And I was drinking more than ever. In fact, um, the last couple years I stopped eating because it was, I didn't want it to ruin my buzz. I had no money. I could only afford malt liquor, you know, the dollar 62, you know, 10% alcohol, steel reserve, uh, Mickey's, you know, old, old English 800. And I'm like pissing my bed every night. Now I don't have a girlfriend. I'm just hanging out with the bums from next door. This guy called Animal, uh, who had stringy, greasy hair and just grunted. And I would party with him because he was the only one that drank like me. And he was literally homeless. Uh, and he smelled bad. I smelled bad. I wasn't showering anymore. And I was getting drunk twice a day. I'd, I would wake up in the morning and drink and then pass out. And then I'd wake up again and drink uh, into the evening. And I couldn't even afford any anything really. Uh, and I just drank with those guys. And, you know, my last girlfriend at that time that drank, you know, she was, she was, we were having huge fights and, um, it was just crazy. Um, I, it got to the point where I was only working two days a week as a caregiver. Uh, I drank at work. Uh, I care, I cared for a guy who couldn't really speak. So he, he couldn't really tattle on me. He liked drinking Coca-Cola, so I'd bring him over a Coca-Cola, and I would drink beer. That was my only job, and I almost got fired from that, because I was starting to, uh, since I wasn't eating, my brain was shutting down. And so I would be at work um, doing a shift change with the other caregiver, and the, the caregiver noticed that he smelled my, he could smell the beer coming off of me, and I was literally like passing out while trying to talk to him. Um, just for a split second because my brain was shutting down. I wasn't eating food and getting drunk twice a day. Um, it was very scary. I looked at my eyes in the morning uh, after that shift, uh, before the shift change. I, was, I had slept over at his house. It was an overnight shift and I drank all night. And I looked at my eyes and I, and I just looked like a dead fish. Like my eyes were glassy. I could barely... I could barely see straight and my brain was, I was like, you know, like woozy and, and passing out and, you know, I was dying. My, even my best friend at that time was like, dude, you're going to die in a year if you don't stop. And he was one of my drinking friends, but he was, I was so pathetic. He didn't even want to drink with me. It was just me and the homeless guy. And I was pissing my bed every night and I could barely drive to work. And cops were watching me. I was drinking and driving. I didn't care. I had like 50, you know, I had like 200 empty beer cans behind my seat of my car. My my car stunk like beer and old cigarettes. My house had beer cans all over it. I lived in a converted school bus uh, that I, you know, I moved into after my parents' 15-foot trailer. And that was my upgrade to a better living, which was just a converted school bus. So... Uh, it was really scary and my heart was still hurting and in my insanity I thought if I drank more beer that it would help my heart it would thin the blood and and help my heart but I was I was very uh, deranged you know I I was living off of alcohol only and um, so now I'm 36 so four years Four years after my heart attack, I'm drinking more than ever, not eating, uh, drinking literally around the clock, having shakes overnight. I couldn't sleep, so I'd have, I always had a tall boy of beer on my bedside table. And I, if I was, if I would wake up at 4 a.m., I would grab more beer and slam it. And then in the morning, I would, my girlfriend at the time would go to work at 8, 8 a.m. and I would be laying in bed and I would pop open a beer, a still reserve, and vomit it all over the place because my, my stomach was so sensitive because I wasn't eating and I couldn't hold down the first beer. And I was crying more than ever. I had uh, an imaginary 
uh, friend, which was a, a butterfly, or no, a bumblebee that hung out in the closet next to the bed. And I called her Mrs. Bumble. And she had big, innocent eyes. And she she cared for me. She she loved me. And I cared for her. And she would make me cry because my imagination, you know, I didn't think she was real, but she was, I was so, I was so lonely and, and, per, and distraught from my disease that I created this imaginary bumblebee that cared for me. It was the only thing that cared for me. My, even my girlfriend beat me up and she went to jail. Uh, I was just a mess. And so Mrs. Bumble would stare out with her big eyes from the closet and she'd make me cry because I was like, this is the only thing that loves me is this imaginary bumblebee. I mean, it was pathetic. It was it was to the point where I, I was I couldn't even listen to music anymore, which is my number one love because it irritated me. I was irritated about everything, even when I was drinking. Uh, the euphoria was gone. The dopamine was depleted. I had no more feel-good chemicals in my brain to make me feel good. Alcohol just barely got me by. I wasn't even normal. It was, it just, it got rid of the hangover and that was about it. There maybe it had been like a 10 minute window of, of, bu of a buzz and then it was gone and then I was pathetic and I was drunk. So, uh, one day... I was at my girlfriend's and I puked up my beer and I was shaking in bed and it was like 8 a.m. 8 and uh, trembling with withdrawals. And my last two beers were in the fridge. I was trying to space them out because beer to me was like my savings account. And if it got less than two beers, I got really nervous because it was like my lifeline. And uh, this guy came over looking for my girlfriend. He was a skateboarder. And uh, he came into my bedroom and I was naked because I sleep in the nude and I couldn't get up. And he just sat in the corner and he picked up my girlfriend's guitar and started making songs about me. He must have been up all night on meth or something. And he came over to, you know, to see her and she was gone to work already. But I was there. This was her house. I was living with her. Even though I still had my school bus down the road, I, I lived with her. And this guy came over and he, he didn't really like me. He thought I was weird. And he started making these songs about me. And even though I was like almost dying, everyone was telling me I was going to die. It didn't matter to me. It didn't, ma it didn't matter if I had a heart attack or anything. What mattered was he started making fun of me and I felt so helpless. I couldn't kick him out of the house. And I just listened to his stupid songs about me. He was singing, you know, he was being really immature and just being like, Eric's weird. He's a weirdo. Eric's likes nobody I've ever met and just being stupid, you know, and I'm like 36. He's like maybe 29, a skate, skateboard punk guy. I couldn't kick him out. And that was the moment I was like, this is it. I am done. It took someone shaming me to make me stop. And that was it. I, I grabbed the last two beers in the fridge. I put them in my backpack and walked back to my house. And I said, after these two beers, I'm not drinking anymore. And those two beers probably saved me from dying from withdrawals because I was such an alcoholic and you can die from withdrawals. So be very careful on how you quit. You might need supervision from a doctor, but those last two beers probably saved me. And then I slept for like two days, went back to work, got two jobs when I could, uh, when I regained my strength and actually started eating food, um, got two jobs, g broke up with that girl, just stayed home, went to work, came home. I would eat a candy bar as a treat and I would drink tea and I just stayed by myself for two years. And then I finally met my current fiance who wasn't a drinker and um, she helped me quit cigarettes and eventually sugar. And uh, I had a couple two day relapses, but I didn't count those as a relapse. I didn't go back to AA and um, I just did it on my own. And then I found God again and uh, started doing spiritual healing with my fiance and 
started um, doing better and I never want to go back to drinking. It's a lie. Every time I went back, it would be worse than before. I quit hundreds of times. I could never quit until finally I hit bottom. And the weirdest thing happened was I got shamed by some punk and that was enough. And I stopped. Uh, and a year or two later, I, I drank, I got drunk for two nights. And then a, a year or two later after that, I drank two nights and I, I just hated it. I hated the feeling. I never wanted to revisit that place. So I stopped and that was it. And that was 13 years ago. Now I'm, uh, you know, my life is not perfect, but I, I have to remind, remind myself where I came from periodically because I'm very thankful to be alive. But I forget that when I get back into life and I'm doing normal stuff and, you know, I forget where I come from sometimes. But I was about, I was dead. That's why I'm doing these, these videos because I was a drunk. I was self-centered. I only thought about me. I hurt a lot of people and I was a taker. And a lot of addicts and alcoholics are takers. They just, they connive and they manipulate and they just want to get there. They just want to get their high on. And so now I want to give back. That That's why I'm still alive. I'm here to help people because I was just so self-centered. Uh, you know, my dad hurt me when I was a little boy. I just put up all these walls around me. I self-isolated. And even the alcohol got, didn't get me out of my shell. It did the first couple of years, but after that, I was drinking alone. I was I was self isolating more than I was ever sober. You know, it didn't help me socialize. It did for maybe two years. Out of the twenty years I drank, only two or three years were you know good, and that was just the illusion of alcohol telling me that I was the life of the party or I was so cool and rebellious. It was all a lie. All it did was tear and tear up my life. And, um, I saw some really crazy, dark perversion, uh, with alcohol and drugs. And I never want to wish that on anyone, uh, you know, with the opiate crisis now and the, the meth epidemic, it's not even being talked about. Um, they want to keep that under the wraps because they have something else they want to talk about. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, so people are committing suicide every day or they're ODing and it's really scary right now. So the least I can do is share my story and, uh, hopefully this helps someone out there because, uh, it, it is life or death. You have to treat it like it's life or death. If you want to drink a beer or shoot up or whatever you want to do, think it all the way through till the next day and and just realize you're gonna feel like crap the next day you're you're gonna do some crazy stuff and you won't even remember it you're gonna hurt some people if you choose to drink or use today play it all the way through because when i wanted to drink i would always just think about the good times the first hour or two but it never lasted First hour was good, second hour was okay, third hour I'm starting to black out, fourth hour I'm getting in fights or getting beat up or kicked out of bars or pissing myself or vomiting or or sleeping with some girl that's horrendous, uh, you know, just stuff I would never do sober. And you're a good person. The only reason why you're messing up right now is from the drugs and the alcohol. It's a lie. It makes you think certain things. I thought I was cool when I drank. It was a total lie. It never did anything good for me. It never improved my writing. It never improved my art. I wasn't an artist because of alcohol and drugs. I was an artist because of the gift God gave me. The alcohol was a lie that made me think that you know, I need to be damaged to be a good artist. That was the lie. And then the lie was you need to drink beer to thin your blood so you don't have another heart attack. Or you need to drink beer because the carbs will keep you alive instead of starving. Really crazy thoughts. And it was all a lie. Okay. I don't really have regrets except for hurting others. Um, but now I can turn this into a gift and help others. And tell you honestly, 
it doesn't ever get better. If, if you're turning to alcohol and drugs, you have a problem. Okay, it's not, it's just going to get worse every single year. It's not going to get better. You're not going to age well because of it. You're not going to get any wisdom. That's a lie. The only thing you're going to get is better and better lies from Satan. And you're going to get so entwined in it, you might not ever return. You'll either wind up in jail or you'll go insane or you'll die. Those are the only three options. You can choose AA, you can do counseling, you can do hypnosis, you can start fasting and doing a juice cleanse, get the toxins out of you, start looking up um, books on sobriety, start doing the work. And all you got to do is improve a little each day. It's only one day at a time. And when it gets really tough, sometimes it's one hour at a, at a time. Day by day, you will put your life back together you will rebuild your foundation and you will look back and be like wow i can't believe i'm still here let's do something with this life it's never too late it's never too late to turn it around but you got to get out of the clutches of that that lie addictions are so brutally dishonest and they're so convincing but once you finally get out of it you will look back and you'll be like, wow, that was a lie. You know, I thought I was, I thought I was a big shot, but really I was pathetic and people were laughing at me. It was really bad. So at least I can, you know, hopefully this gives you some insight. Watch Intervention on uh, TV. That's a good show. You'll see how pathetic they are and how they turn around in just 60 days of treatment. I love the before and after. A video of these people that go to, on the show intervention they're just destroying their family it, it's such a it destroys your family so bad and then when they get sober and they come back 60 days later or 90 days after the treatment they look awesome they got light in their eyes again they're smiling they never smiled when they were using you know people think they're having fun with them when they're using they're not there's usually lots of crying and there's lots of heartache and the whole family gets torn up. But when they come back after 60 days or 90, 90 days of sobriety, they're, they're smiling. They got light in their eyes and they're like, they're like, all right, I am alive. Let's do this. Let's go, let's go help some other addicts. So I love you guys. I hope this will help you. Uh, it's definitely worth living. It's definitely worth living. Just get out of your addiction one day at a time. Get your help. Get help. And uh, I love you guys. You're going to do it. You're going to be fine. And we'll talk to you soon.